not knowing how to deal with things, how to get rid of a term like this. Um, so, so I think this is a big um, open um, problem. How do you do this without some, some one over epsilon squared term and how many edges you actually need to keep it? There's some people who are very excited about some of this technology because it's related to other things and understanding matrices. And the, the, next, the next issue I, I will tell you how to fix, and that has, and, and that has applications to, to lots of other things as we'll see. Um, but it still has this one over epsilon squared property um, in the size here. Still some people think that this is like a, a really interesting thing and that this should not be a problem because it's some to be some constant. But but yeah, I think for anything practical you need to somehow fix this. Um, okay, so that's the bad news. Um, there's still some very bright people like uh, some of the top researchers in the, in the field who are very excited by this, this line of work. And and the uh, um, and if uh, the, the other problem they have been able to solve allows this technique to be much more general. And this only works when I'm looking at the cost of these cuts. And the cut places each vertex into one set S or T. Right? And so this is kind of, it's not the full property. This doesn't preserve things like um, the page rank vector. Right? The page rank vector is not a cut into two halves of the graph. It's it's some vector of a of a um, of a value on each of the each of the vertices of the, of the graph, right? This is essentially assigning each each uh, vertex to be a zero or a one, a zero if it's an S, a one if it's a T, so something like that. But you can think of any vector where you put a weight on each of the vertices, right? So um, so, so what I want is some um, some vector in in R, V, and so I somehow want to measure how good the sparse version of the graph is against this, this vector here. And so how I do this is I need to write down the um, Laplacian of the graph. So everyone remembers the Laplacian of a graph is going to be um, the Um, uh, um, this diagonal or uh, this degree matrix, which is diagonal and has the the, the, the degree of, of every vertex on on the you know for the height vertex and the height spot on the diagonal, it has its degree, and this is the adjacency vertex, uh, the, the adjacency matrix, which has a one in element ij if there's an edge between i and j. Right, so we talked about this a couple times. So this is the um, Laplace on the graph, and this really characterizes a lot of properties of right. um, So what, what we want to do instead is to have some, um, what we want to get is some graph um, H and its Laplace and LH um, such that the, if we look at the L2 norm, between LG and LH, this is less than, this is always less than epsilon. Okay, um, and let me write down in a different way um, what this means. Um, this is equivalent to, um, So for any vector x, this is one, 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 one. Right, so, so if I so you can think of this this L2 norm is essentially taking the maximum, the maximum over all vectors, um, and 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 multiplying it through um, by this um, by this Laplace matrix. Uh, right. So 
Um, so this is going to give you, um, is it, so this is equivalent to 1 plus, or 1 minus epsilon times LG if I haven't done the transpose of something. Uh, So if I take the two norm by dotting this this um, um, this Laplacian matrix with this x, and then I take the L two norm of it, and I square it, then um, this is going to be equivalent. Um, so in the, the, this is this is L two norm here, and there may be a square there or something, but the, there's some property that the squares you can push into the epsilon if you want, right? But it's so, this, so what, I, what I'm hoping to um, um, convince you is that this Laplacian property is, is a much stronger property than the graph cut property. Because this vector, in the, this is, is similar to what the graph cut property is saying, but that requires this vector to be just um, 0, 1. Where this allows this, this vector to be and you, you still get the same sort of epsilon approximation guarantee. Um, and so it turns out that you can, you can get this sort of guarantee by changing this probability that you, um, that you select the point spot. Instead of doing this, what you need to do is to select them um, um, so, so, so you need to um, um, set p equals to um, to be proportional to the um, um, to the effective resistance between i and j in the graph, right? So, um, so, for, um, so for any of the electrical engineering people, right? You you've probably seen um, like the effective resistance of a circuit before. Maybe has anyone heard of this? Is this so? Who's never heard of effective resistance? And who's heard of effective resistance? And who's it's the end of the semester and you're too tired to read the razor? <laughs> okay. Well, I should have expected any hands for that. So um, that would have been like a paradox for skip. So. Um, so the, 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 the so there's this cool way of thinking of um, the graph as as a uh, the, the thinking of the graph as a circuit, right? So you can think of um, a simple example here, can be U V A, and so if you have edges like this, and so you can think of putting. I, one unit of current into U. So, so I haven't taken a double E class in a long time. But you put there's there's some better actual notation for this, right? Um, but you have one um, um, unit of current in. I guess this is a source or something, and then this is going to be a sink um, that's taking out um, one unit of of current, and I guess we have these resistors here. And they each have an edge weight, and the resistors are all going to be a resistor of one. Right? So if you only have this edge UV, then the resistance of this edge is one. But the but the effect of resistance is if you put one current in here, and it can go any way at once and come out B. Um, so, if, so so does anyone remember how to calculate the effect of resistance of U? I think it goes down and back. Right, yeah. So so you can the current can go in parallel and, and there's this formula of how you can do it, right? So so the the current can go this way as well, but it has to go through two resistors here. Right? So it's going to be something like the um, effective resistance of, of U V 
the is going to be um, one over, um, and then I put in parallel the the, the, the two possible ways. Um, one way has as a and I do as a resistance of one. I go here and one as a resistance of two. If I go through a, I get one half, and so then this is equal to two thirds. Okay, so if you haven't seen this before, um, um, I'm not going to teach you today. Um, but, but hopefully you've, you've, you've seen some of this. You've seen some of this before. Maybe it kind of brings back some memories of, I could look up and figure out how to do that. And there's, there's something I've seen before. If you haven't seen it before, well, um, it's, it's a really cool stuff. And there's this relationship between how fast markup chains mix, mix and the resistance of a of a graph and something else. So this also relates to like what is the page rank vector. It's all tied. This effective resistance is just another way of thinking about it. And so there's actually, I think there's actually a way to solve for the page rank vector using the effective resistance. But you're you're better off doing some of the other techniques. Um, okay. So so then the so so then I'm giving the weight to the edge U V is two thirds, right? And in fact, in this simple graph, all the edges have the same weight because it's um, um, by symmetry they all have the same effective resistance. But you can see a different, a more complicated graph like this. And now this edge would have an effective resistance of one, which is as large as it could be from i to j. So you want to, so you want to sample this with a very high probability, with probability one. Um, as, as, as long as you have a budget for it. Um, and, but this edge is not so important because there's not a lot of other things, there's, there's lots of other ways I can get through from this edge to this edge. Well, I mean, from this vertex to this vertex. So this one is, is not going to be as important, or, or maybe even this one is going to be even less. There are a bunch of ways I can get around it. So, so this effective resistance has a better way of telling me how important these edges are. And so if I set, so if I calculate the effective resistance of all edges, and then I, and I want to sample t different edges still, instead of just one edge, right? So I'm still going to sample t edges, um, or actually t times the number of vertices of edges. I'm going to sample this many different edges. If I, and if I do a proportional to this value, so I, I sum up all the effective resistances of all the edges, and I um, and then I um, I multiply that times t times the number of vertices I have, where t is still going to be this value. Then I'm going to preserve this stronger property has to do with the Laplace. So by by changing this probability that I, I sample things from, I get a, I also get this graph cut property. But I get these other properties that have to, have to do with the Laplacian as well. And so this will preserve not only the cuts in the graph and the communities, um, but also preserve things like um, um, that relate to the page rank factor as well. So this is a stronger property. So and, and because it has to do with the Laplacian, the Laplacian has to do is very related to a lot of um, to, to things you want to do from the perspective of linear algebra. Um, on a matrix, and people want to do stuff like this for these large uh, sparse matrices, and they do a large sparse matrix as a graph, so it's really a way of compressing a large sparse matrix um, for, for a lot of different uh, for a lot of different applications. So there's a lot of excitement in in the in the algorithms community about this this sort of work. Um, there's I think there are some faster just this last year there's some papers on doing a fast way to compute. Um, graph cuts that's been built on some of this technology. So you still need something like this many uh, t times, so you still need like t times the number of, of, of edges, which is, is, could be large, but it works even when the, when the edge set is, is actually very dense. And you get to work even when there are, there are weights on edges. Um, so there, so, um, if, if you see some some uh, 
some some work where they're trying to approximate the or approximate the um, Laplacian of a graph. It's using some form of this technology somehow speeding up this process. But still, a lot of these techniques have this hidden one over epsilon squared. So um, they kind of have to get lucky to be actually useful in practice. So, so sometimes this this term does not get in the way, and kind of a, a greedy way of doing this will not have this problem. Um, okay, so so this is what I was going to say about. So I'm going to talk about a different type of graph sparsification, um, which which is very rarely compared to this type. Actually, next um, based on spanners and more geometric view of graphs. But do you have any questions about? This this term this form of sparsification. Okay. Um, all right. So let me. Um, so which color is working the best? One of the things about the end of the semester is all my markers are starting to wear out. Uh, the blue and the green? All right. All right, so um, so a spanner. Um, so a spanner is based on where we have some sort of metric on defining all the vertices. So you've got some. Um, so you've got some graph, um, you still have some graph um, um, with the vertices and edges. And, but sometimes you, you, you define the edges, um, so sometimes you think that you have all edges between all pairs of, of, the, of the vertices. And you've got some distance between every, um, um, V1 and V2. So you can define a distance between um, any two vertices. And we're going to try and preserve this distance while making the graph sparser. Okay, so sometimes this distance um, is, is actually just the Euclidean distance. And this is the case where V is actually a subset of, say, RD. So the vertices are actually points in the, in the plane. And then you can think of initially, you're going to, um, um, you're going to keep the, um, you have, you have uh, n choose two, if you have n vertices, you have n choose two edges. But you only want to keep a small number of these edges. Um, but, but after you sparsify it, you can only use the distance by walking on the graph. So you can no longer, um, you can no longer calculate the um, Euclidean distance. Um, so, the, um, and so what I mean by the graph distance is sometimes this is the input as well. Um, so, um, so maybe the input is is the graph distance. And so this is what I was talking about before, where we get from a vertex. Um, this vertex A to this vertex B, then I could just say it's the it's the sum of the weights of all the edges I have to cross to get here. So if each have a weight one, then the distance is five. One, two, three, four, five. If they had more weights on them, um, it, it, it could have been that this one had a weight of uh, of one, of, or let's say a three, of two, of um, of one, of two, six. And maybe the shortest one is now to go up here, and this one's a weight one, this one's a weight two, so I can go like this instead, going across. And maybe I don't need to use the six, I can use a three and a one to go down. Um, so then this graph distance, I can define it as dg of vu is equal to the, um, Um, the minimum um, of all of, let's say, uh, um, 
x in the neighborhood of v of the distance from v to x plus the or um, the weight on the edge from v to x plus the graph distance from x to v. So, um, so this is a recursive definition, right? So if I have a graph, um, and this is vertex v, and I want to get to u. So if I want to get from B to U, then I can look at any of the neighbors and this all the all the vertices which are connected to B by one edge, they they, they share an edge with V. Um, this is the neighborhood of B. So I can think of finding the minimum of the weight from B to one of its neighbors plus the distance in the graph from X to U. So I can think of computing this recursively. Right? I've defined it recursively here. I haven't told you how to compute it, but you can compute it using something like Dijkstra's, right? Um, um, so this is the graph distance. So what I want is I want to turn G, uh, my goal is to create a, um, a T-spanner is, is, is going to be from G to, to H that has the property that, that 1 is less than or equal to um, in the new graph is going to be larger than that in the old graph because I've taken away shortcuts. Okay, all I'm going to do is I'm going to take away edges. So I'm taking away shortcuts, so the new distance is going to be larger. But for every two vertices, the, the ratio of the di distances is no bigger than t. Sometimes you write this t is equal to, say, a, a 1 plus epsilon. So you can think of a ratio as 1 plus epsilon between the distances. So before, I was preserving things like the cuts or the kind of the electrical flow through a network. Now I'm preserving something like the distance um, along these edges. And so I want H to have a lot fewer edges. And so then one of the questions is how few edges can I use to represent this graph? So I can start with this graph distance on G, or this graph, original graph distance that may have been a complete graph, and then I can calculate the Euclidean distance for say. And so a lot of the study has been when the original thing is Euclidean. Right? And then you want to create some small graph that represents all the Euclidean distances. Okay, and so there, there are um, <coughs> there, there are a few properties that people try and preserve here. It's not just minimizing the number of edges. Um, so, th so what you want is, you know, one property is a small um, total um, um, number of edges, right? So, so, so this is an obvious thing. This was similar to the other graph sparsification. Um, so, so you also want a small um, um, total weight. So it could be, especially here, the, the weight of the edges is not generally going to be just one. It's going to actually correspond to something like the Euclidean distance, underlying Euclidean distance. Now these, these Euclidean distances may not be, um, it may not be, it may not be exactly Euclidean, maybe like a road network, right? So, you know, if, if I drive from here to, if I drive from from here to downtown, it's basically the distance to downtown 
but I have to kind of swerve around to get out of the university a little bit. So I can't go directly downtown. I, I guess once I get on, on 200, I can because Salt Lake is a nice grid, right? But if I wanted to get to, if I want to get to Provo, for instance, the Euclidean distance is a good guess, but I'm probably going to have to go down um, a little bit west to get around the point of the mountain, right? And, and then further south down to get to Provo. So to think of this as being something like Euclidean distance, but uh, but maybe not exactly. And, and I want to say a small number of rows, which really captures how long it takes to get from one place to another. And so often when you're routing with stuff in a GPS, um, or you're trying to figure out the fastest route, often they're, they're actually built on these uh, these roads, which are um, these, these this kind of backbone of roads, which most people take, right? So that this includes the interstates. If you're looking at all the US, you're, it's more likely to route you on interstate because these are these edges are, are really important, right? Um, if you want to go a far distance, you you will you know you're probably going to get to the interstate, and so they'll try routing you in the interstate, and then they may locally optimize off of that. Um, so so think of this spanner as you know as something like a sparse road network, which can still get you everywhere, and the the time it takes to get you is not too much more. Um, but there's also a third criteria, is that um, no um, vertex uh, um, degree is too high, right? Um, so why would this make sense? Why would you want to optimize this? Why would you want to have a small degree for Let's go back to road numbers, right? Let's say I, I'm just going to tell you all the roads, and I've got some, and, and, and I've got some, uh, some interchange which has 20 roads coming into it. Is this going to work very well? Yeah. So, it's, so if you have a lot of edges going to one vertex, this vertex essentially has to do a lot of the routing, right? You don't want to put too much strain on one vertex for route too much. See, so, so, so it, and this comes up not just in road networks, but if, say, if you have a, a, a backbone of, of, uh, of routers on the internet, that, that you have trusted routers, you want to, you know, go in and reinforce these things, well, you don't want to put too much uh, strain on one of the routers. So you may say, I'm, or I'm, um, so, so I'm going to duplicate a router that's getting a lot of traffic coming in and out of it. Um, or if, if, you're, if you're trying to use this to design some sort of a, um, communication, uh, if you're trying to do some global computation on some data set, this will often correspond to how you would decompose the data set. And if, and one computer may need, may need to deal with the the communication from other computers and other nodes, and so then this would overload this one computer if you're doing some parallel computation. Um, so that there are various reasons why you don't want the de any degree of a vertex to be too large. Okay. Um, so let's. Um, so I, I, I'm going to tell you some. So I, I I'm just going to sketch three basic algorithms how you can do this. How you can create what's what's called a what's called a t-spanner for a graph, and the, the the first one is going to be completely general, but it's hard to say it has interesting bounds on it. And then the second two will be more geometric, and they're going to assume that the input is going to be some sort of points in R D, and the distance is going to be Euclidean. Um, okay, so. Um, the first one is is uh, on this. It's, it's going to be simple. So um, um, I'm going to call the first one greedy. And so, how would you design a greedy algorithm to try and choose the edges which you want to keep? Let's, 
let, let's draw an example on the graph here. <coughs> So how is this reading out the carbon going to work? So, um, so, so how, would I, how would I choose which edges to keep? You know, the edges with the least number of uh, edges, or the, the nodes with the least number of edges? Um, keep those. Well, I'm going to keep all the vertices. I'm going to keep all the nodes, but I'm not going to keep all the edges. And, and, and actually, I'm not going to worry about this constraint on degree. You know, let's not worry about this one. I will mention at the end how you can kind of how you can kind of get around this with a different technique, but not this one. You can get rid of these two, like the cross that you made. Like there is the reason is because the other ones are still connected. If you remove those, and the distance would not be affected by a lot. Um, Okay, but, but how would I design an algorithm? Why would I choose those first from an algorithm? Just like if you visit uh, a vertex more than once, from, uh, remove that edge, basically. If I, if I use a vertex more than once, I'm going to remove the edge that's connected it. So like if, if you're traveling along and you see something uh, that you've already seen previously, just remove that edge that you're traveling along. Um, kind of close, but so if I if I only if I only keep one edge per vertex, then I'm going to have all these pairs of vertices that are not connected, right? So I need to make sure that they're connected. Uh, for each cycle that you find, you can delete that random edge. Oh, um, um, okay. So that's um, that's close. So, so this is like the minimum spanning tree here, right? You look at all the cycles. And you delete made the longest edge in every site, right? But but that's probably not how you would implement this. You're not going to first look for all cycles and then do this. You're going to slowly um, slowly build up your graph. So instead of um, removing edges, I'm going to add edges one by one. I'm going to add an edge one by one until I don't need to add edges anymore. Uh, once. So it's complete, so all that vertices is at the same degree. Right. Can you solve based on distances between all places? Okay, this is good. If you do that, you can compare against that the constraint that you have. Yes. Sort the edges by their by their distance, and then and then I'm going to you to compare it against um, to this one along that street. So if so, if this value is greater than the error, right, then you can add it to the this one. Oh, good. That's right. I was just thinking maybe we can just keep those edges which are. Yeah, yeah, so that, um, that sounds really close to what Amai was saying, but his was a bit more specific. So, this, so, let me, so, so, so let me go over this carefully. So you're going to sort all the edges by their distance from the smallest length to the largest length. And then you're going to, um, so, um, and then do a, uh, um, do um, E and the edges in this sort of order. Um, if um, we'll call this this constraint. If um, one is less than, um, so this will be edge u b. If um, then 
that stuff. All right, so I'm just going to loop. I'm going to process these edges. And each edge, I'm going to check if this constraint sets up. Okay, so I'm going to start here with an empty with an empty graph. And the first edge I'm going to look at is going to be this edge. Now, since dh is is going to be um, so, since dh is not going to be connected because I have no edges yet. This is going to be infinity, so clearly it's not satisfied. I have to add this edge. Then I'm going to look at this edge, and it's not connected, so I have to add it. Then the next smallest edge is going to be this one, maybe. But maybe this constraint, maybe t is 2. right? So t is like we're going to get a 2 spanner. And this distance is going to be um, less than than uh, one half of the sum of these two distances. So I don't add this edge. Um, okay, so, that, so now I want to look at the next longest edge. Maybe it's this one. It's not connected, so I make it connect. Then maybe the next longest edge is here. Um, and maybe it's two, so it's not within the distance two again. Um, and then maybe I look at this long edge. I don't need to add it again. This, or maybe I do need to add this edge, because going here is just more than two times this distance. Right? And now I look at this edge, and I say this is. I need to add this edge because it was not connected. And then I look at, and maybe I, but I don't need to add this edge. And maybe I don't need to add this one. And I don't need to add this one. So I'm done. Did that make sense? So you can just greedily add the ed edges from shortest to longest and add them if, if this constraint is not satisfied. Um, if this is not satisfied, then add. 